So hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio, and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University, where the Sukhai Weishu Collaborative Learning Project is based. Today, we want to welcome everyone to our fifth book discussion. We are looking at Professor Nicholas Tampio's Teaching Political Theory, a Pluralistic Approach. We have a very nice lineup of scholars to discuss this book with Professor Tampio. Our commentators today include Peng Yu or Yu Peng from Earlham College. Professor, all right, Paula, I know you just told me, but I think I'm going to mess it up. Um, uh, Paula, oh, no, I can't do it. Paula <laughs> Ocho es Espajo? Okay, that's enough. Um, and then uh, Professor Andrew March from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. We also have my good friend and colleague, Professor Amy Zhuhui Ling, uh, who's from Capital Normal University in Beijing, serving as chair for this session. I want to thank everyone who's been invited and everyone in the audience for making this event possible. The structure of our event is as follows. After I briefly introduce Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Project, our chair, Professor Zhu, will introduce Professor Tampio, then Professor Tampio will give a brief overview of his book, lasting maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And then the three commentators will discuss their comments with him before we open the floor to comments from the audience. The event will end promptly at 11 o'clock, which is about two hours from now. I also want to note that this is not an author meets critic session. Our main goal is to foster congenial and productive discussion. So while criticisms are welcome, they are not prioritized. The Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Project believes that we can engage meaningfully and critically with ideas without necessarily disagreeing or attempting or trying to find areas or ways in which someone might be wrong. Before getting started and handing things over to Professor Ju, I'll then just say a few words about the Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes that we sometimes see in academic exchanges. The Sihai Weishu Collaborative Learning Projects seeks to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchanges by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. Now, before I hand things over to Professor Ju, let me briefly introduce her. Professor Ju holds a PhD from Tsinghua University and now serves as Associate Professor of Philosophy at Capital Normal University in Beijing. She has been studying and teaching political philosophy for many years and has worked closely with Professor Michael Sandel. She has translated his books and spent a couple of years as a visiting fellow at Harvard University working with him there as well. I also want to say that I know Professor Ju quite well, and while she often emphasizes her work as a translator and as a teacher, she is a very excellent scholar. Um, but more importantly, she's a very nice and a very engaging person. Um, so she's someone we definitely want to be around, and I hope that you will continue to come to other Sahai Weisra events, Amy, and participate in them. So uh, the floor is now yours. Hey, thank you, Paul. It's Thank you, and thank Sihe Weishu for giving me this chance to 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 know you here. It's my sorry. There's something wrong with. Uh, it's my great honor. Can you hear? hear? Yeah, we can still hear. I'm sorry, I the app just the 
just created spontaneously. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's my great honor to be to be the chair for this book discussion. And first, firstly, please let me to introduce Professor Nicholas Tempio. And Pro Professor Nicholas Tempio is a professor of political science at Fordham University. He has published the books um, Teaching Political Theory, Why de Democracies Should Not Have National Education Standards, The Political Version of the French Philosopher Gilles Deleuze and how temporary, te uh, contemporary political theories advance the legacy of the Enlightenment. Tempio serves at, as an editor of the journal, uh, journal Comparative Political Theory and a faculty advisor to the Fordham, Fordham Political Review and the Fordham Pi Sigma Alpha Chapter. Tempio often writes for public facing outlets such as the Boston Globe, USA Today, and the Washington Post. And his articles have been translated into Albanian, Chinese, Croatian, Estonian, uh, French, Hebrew, Italian, Japanese, Persian, Portuguese, Serbian, Spanish, Turkish, and Vietnamese. His aerial essay, Look Up From Your Screen, is included in the Norton Reader alongside essays by Maya Angelou, Frederick Douglass, and Benjamin Franklin. He is currently preparing a new edition of John Dewey's Democracy and Education. And today, he, we, we, we have such a great honor. He, he will pre present his new book uh, on teaching political philosophy. So please, uh, please present your book for like 20 or uh, 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very nice introduction. I'm, I'm very glad to be part of the Sea Highway Shoe. And it's wonderful to see friends and, uh, you know, old friends and, and making new friends. So it's really, um, thank you for everybody who is participating. So what I'd like to do is um, go through a PowerPoint and talk about uh, my book a little bit. And so even if you haven't read the book, you know, you could still be part of the conversation. So uh, I want to go through different questions. What is political theory? Why should political science departments offer political theory courses? How do you get a deep understanding of politics? Um, that was one of the big questions I was trying to think about in the book. So it's about teaching, but it's also about really what is political theory? How do you stage a conversation between political thinkers living in different times and places? I mean, I think that's how you get a deep understanding of politics, but it's a challenge to try to think about how you get people in different times and places. So that was one of the things I talked about in the book. Uh, what's a good assignment to prompt students to think? Um, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink that that uh, you have to try to figure out how you can get students uh, to do political theory as undergrads, which is not necessarily easy. So I, I have some assignments that I can talk about. Uh, what's a practical tip to give better lectures? I, uh, in the book there, each chapter has a little box where I share some practical nuts and bolts advice about being a good teacher. So I just wanted to share one of those pieces of advice. And then I, uh, I, the last chapter of the book is how you teach the public, right? So we teach our undergraduates when we're in the class, but sometimes we can read, write for the public. And, and um, as uh, Professor Ju was explaining, I sometimes write for the public and I have certain ideas that I wanted to share about how to do political theory for a, a big audience. So I'll go through each of these questions and I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. So what is political theory? Why should political science departments offer political theory courses? So one thing I tell my students, the first class, is that I, um, I pull up the headlines from the New York Times and I write them on the board. And I explain to students that journalism covers the waves of politics, that you can think of political life as like an ocean and day-to-day uh, -day, nonstop barrage their news stories. And so there's always something for the news to cover. And so I write the stories uh, on the board. But then what happens is you go to college and you realize, well, I want a deeper understanding of politics, right? So we can focus on Trump and Biden and Obama, but there are scholars who dedicate their whole lives to studying the presidency. And there's all sorts of interesting research on 
what presidents can do when the other party controls the Congress or what, uh, you know, what's the window when they're most effective or how does uh, domestic affairs inter affect international affairs and their patterns. <clears throat> so it's not just biographical, that's like a shallow understanding of politics that but political science researchers can get a much deeper understanding of, of politics. So I say that the social sciences investigate the tides of politics. So every day the water's coming in and going out and, um, and there's like a deeper flow that explains what's happening in the water. And so, so social science understands and researches that. But then uh, when I was a graduate student, this boat capsized in the North Atlantic and it was filled with uh, little plastic toys, little yellow duckies and little green frogs. And what sort of made it a news, why people were talking about it, is that these plastic toys started a journey around the globe. And so you could you could use these toys as a way to understand the ocean flows. So it takes about seven years for, for the water to circulate around the globe, right? That it freezes and then it melts and then it, that's what gets the circulation pump going. And when I heard this story, I said, that's what I do in political science. That's that's my role in political theory. That I I explore the ocean flows of politics. So I uh, have some connection to Trump or Biden. I have some connection to the presidency, but the president is a human being. And one of the things that I do is I study human nature, and we never actually see with our eyes human nature. We see human beings. We see human beings doing things but we never actually see freedom or reason or instincts, right? These are all things that we're making inferences uh, about human nature. And these inferences are always going to, going to be contestable. So for me, uh, political theory is always trying to understand these deep, hard questions that uh, do not allow of easy answers and yet are very important. So for me, political theory is the ocean, is the study of the ocean flows of politics. Um, why should political science departments offer political theory courses? Because you need people to study the deep questions that, that you need people to think about what is reality? What is human nature? What can human beings know? What is freedom? What is justice, right? That, I mean, uh, one of the major concepts of political thought, political philosophy, right, goes back to the, arguably the founding text of Western political philosophy, Plato's Republic, what is justice? It's an idea. You can't see an idea with your with your eyes that you have to sort of make a mental journey to see it. So, uh, or what is equality, right? That we just take it for granted that human beings are equal with one another, men, women, you know, people in my country, people in another country. Well, maybe I shouldn't say we all take it for granted, but many Western liberals take it for granted. And yet with our eyes, we see people who are taller, shorter, richer, poorer, right? all sorts of physical differences. So we have to think about what is equality. And undergraduates want to think about these questions, right? I mean, certainly when I showed up at college, I wanted to think about the big questions of, am I a Democrat? Am I a Republican? Am I a liberal? Am I a conservative? What do these questions mean, right? So, um, and part of the reason I wrote the book is I wanted to give resources to other political theorists why they could, how they can make an argument to their colleagues. So I'm very interested in hearing from Paulina and Pung and Andrew, like th does that metaphor work? Does this language work or does it not? Do you prefer a different way to make a case for political theory and political science? That's the first question. All right, let's keep moving. Um, how do you get a deep understanding of politics, right? So I, I'm suggesting that the, the book cover, you can see the ocean currents, I, was very happy that NASA gave me permission to use this book cover because it's a gives you a visualization of what I think political theory is. How do you how do you get that? And I mean, I think the way to do it is to study the people who have done it, right? See see what they do, study from them. And for me, I mean, the the, the classic example of the deeper understanding of politics is Karl Marx. That Karl Marx says there's all this ephemeral stuff ideology, but that there's to really understand the nature of reality, you need to understand the means of production, the modes of production, uh, what kind of technology are people using, who owns these technology, who's profiting from them. So uh, there's a there's a lot of 
of Marx that I don't like, but but certainly I think there's parts that I do like. And one part that I like of Marx is that you have to understand uh, economics to understand politics. But you can find other philosophers who have uh, accounts of the ocean flows of politics, right? So Nietzsche discusses the will to power. Every animal instinctively strives to maximize its power. Like, how can you use that as a clue? Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that I, the editor of the journal Comparative Political Theory, is that I want to start reading uh, non-Western accounts of the ocean flows of politics. So this this semester I'm teaching Mengsa and Chunsa, Mencius and Chunsa, and they have a famous debate about human nature. Is it good? Do we have sprouts of goodness or are we, or are we evil? And um, that once you start reading these authors, you realize they're as, they're as profound as Plato and Aristotle uh, on some of these questions. And yet they're different, right? They, they don't have, they're not consumed by questions of the ill, of the will or original sin or, or certain notions that affect a lot of Western political philosophy. So um, for me, I just think that, you know, I want, I'm greedy. I, I want as many, I want the best authors I can find who do it. And if they're in political science departments, cool. But if, if it's Max Weber, if it's St. Augustine, right, if it's sociology or theology, the, the boundaries between these academic disciplines are, are, are porous. So as a political theorist, I'm responsible for teaching certain authors at my university. I teach, I'm the uh, Machiavelli guy or uh, the Federalist Papers, right, that I'm pretty much the, the one professor at, at my university who teaches a bunch of different authors. But that's that's right. That's that's what an academic tradition is. That we're we're responsible for handing over certain books. So um, part of the, the view that I'm doing in this book, and you know, I'm glad Paulina's on, on this committee because we went to or this symposium because we we both went to Johns Hopkins, and I'd like to think if there's a Hopkins school of political theory, it's just going all over the place to try to get different sources. Um, so that's that's uh, how I think you get a deep understanding of politics. Near the end of the book, I have a chapter on uh, neuroscience and uh, that I think that when you get really good at political theory, you say, all right, well, I want to try to, I want to do what the masters did. And what the masters did is that they all study natural science. So I'm, I'm that chapter is more uh, exploratory about how you can, how political theorists can engage neuroscience or science in general to try to advance the conversation so we're concerned about human nature. These people are doing amazing research on the brain and the second brain and the stomach and the uh, the nervous system. And there's people doing interesting work on nutrition and and uh, smell. Uh, A.S. Barwich at Indiana University wrote a really fantastic book on smellosophy. And so uh, I try to I try to say how political theorists can break new ground by by reading natural science. Um, okay, so we're one of the ways that I think we get a deep understanding of politics is that we have Socratic dialogues with the smartest people that we can find. But but somebody like uh, Mencius is living in the third century BCE in the Warring States period in China. He has no point, no overlap with me, right? That he is speaking a different language and I'm speaking a different. One thing I tell students is that Western political philosophy works on a Western or a Greek hard drive, right? So lots of Western political philosophy is about Archie who gets to hold the, the wheels of power, the, the steering wheel of, of the ship of state. So it's it's really about power. And so the software is who, who gets to have the power, but the hardware is the politics is about who gets power. Somebody like Mencius, uh, some similarities and some differences. And if you, if you take like a strict, Cambridge School history of political thought approach, uh, there's no reason for me to really understand Mencius other than maybe intellectual curiosity that if I try to apply him to the present, I'll be violating all sorts of strictures and doing all sorts of violence to him, taking him from a different place. You know, so what, right? I mean, we, every time we read a book, we're taking it from a different from an author in a different subject position, and we're trying to figure out if the ideas can help us. So I don't, I don't get too hung up in the Cambridge School. Uh, Lee Jenko makes a similar approach that she, you know, she sets the bar very, very high for reading uh, authors in other traditions. I, I don't know. I think that 
the, these people are being translated. People want to discuss them. I want to do my part and, and take advantage of these translations and the work that excellent scholars are doing. Right, Peng, Peng's done fantastic work on Zhuangzi. I want I want to access it and think about it, even though I'm sure I'll miss nuances. But anyhow, how do we engage political thinkers who live in different times and places? Um, I, the way that I do it is you stage a conversation that these great thinkers disagree. You want to you want to join the conversation with Mengzi, Mengzi and Shunzi. How do you do it? The way that I do it in my classes is I ask the authors the same questions. When did you live? What was the major problem in the world that you were thinking about? What was your disagreement with the, the other thinkers in your time and place? Why did you have to write a new book? Clearly, you're, you think that other authors weren't doing it. How did you frame your philosophical problem? What is your view of human nature? How do you think human beings differ from other animals? How do you think human beings differ from one another? What are the basic rules of politics, the basic principles of politics? So I asked my students, if you wanted to know the, the principles of American politics, you'd look to the constitution, all right? So these are the basic rules. And, I would say that the vast majority of political theorists have certain basic rules about politics. And what are those, those basic rules? I mean, you know, these are staging questions. Uh, Hannah Arendt is very testy at the beginning of the human condition. I don't say anything about human nature. This is about the human condition. Granted, but still, you know, she's thinking about the same types of questions that have consumed Western political philosophy. Um, when we think about human nature, right? So uh, in Chinese, they'll talk about xing. Well, yeah, you know, human nature carries all sorts of baggage and Chinese will be different, but you could, there's still enough that you can uh, get a conversation going. How do they justify their views? Do they point to history? Do they use more rationation, more reason to try to think about how to justify things, right? Is it more rationalist or more empiricist? And then uh, I always ask the students, what do, they, what do you all think, right? Are you sympathetic? I mean, who's right? Are, are human beings instinctively going to try to help a child about to fall into a well? Is that, does, does uh, Monksa's thought experiment, does it work? Does it sound right? Does his explanation of Ox Mountain as the sort of the source of evil that the environment eats away at our goodness, does that strike you as right? Um, so uh, when I go through these questions, I think about, um, and, and if I teach an if I teach a class with say seven authors, now I've got a grid, right? I've got I've got seven columns and six rows, and we go through the questions together. And so there, the course has a plan. It's not just sightseeing. I wanna I wanna go in with a strategy to bring these. So I let the conversation flow naturally, uh, much more now than at the beginning of my career. At the beginning of my career, I used to lecture for more of class. Now I just in my mental note, I just want to make sure I hit all of these points. And if we do it in a conversation and if the students can figure it out on their own, <clears throat> that's better. Right? It's always better when you can figure it out for yourself rather than to have a teacher uh, give it to you. That's part of part of my John Dewey uh, influence that you, know, you, you learn by doing. So if you can get students to do political theory, that's by far a better strategy than lecturing at them. Um, and then the book has chapters. I have a chapter on Han Feitze and Machiavelli. They're the great badasses of political theory, the realists, the legalists, that um, there are similarities and there are differences. And so it's fun to talk with students about the different advice they give the ruler for handling ministers. So uh, we talk about Machiavelli, where he has his henchmen do the dirty work. And then we read Han Feitze, who says, no, no, don't have your, don't give the dogs, your fans, because they'll take advantage of you and then everybody will fear them and the ministers will become powerful. So it's a lot of fun to talk with students about the, the differences. Are they, the question is, you know, are they really that different, Han Feitze and Machiavelli? So there are differences, but is it really that big? And another one, um, you know, very much relying on Peng Yu's work about Zhuangzi and Sextus and Pericus, we do political theory because we care about things. And, you know, Andrew March, uh, my friend Andrew, I, you know, he talks about conjectural political theory that we, we try to do a good faith effort to reinterpret our interlocutors tradition to get them to maybe arrive at a position that we're sympathetic to. So, um, you know, I want there to be more freedom in the world. I want there to be free speech. I want there to be the right to dissent. 
right? Uh, what kind of arguments can I make with ch Chinese interlocutors? Well, you could say, well, you've got this tradition uh, of Zhuangzi. If you look in the West with Sextus Empiricus, Sextus Empiricus was read in the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment and he's sort of in the backdrop of a lot of thinking about the First Amendment and free speech and human rights. Can we do something similar with Zhuangzi? Right? Is there a way that we can get an appreciation of uh, minority perspectives that Zhuangzi seems to represent? Is there a way that we can have a politics of Wu Wei, that, of letting go of spontaneous action, of, of, of not having the government force people to, uh, to try to clamp down on dissent? So those are the those are the two chapters. Those were a lot of fun to, to write. Um, I hope they give people an idea of how to do comparative political theory. Obviously, I'm joining a tradition. A lot of people are doing excellent work. Uh, what's a good assignment to prompt students to think? You know, I was, I was grateful that Edward Elger asked me to, to write this book because it gave me a chance to just have in print things what I've been doing. And one thing that I do to get students to think is ask students to present on what the author would say about a current event. So this strikes me as a manageable project to give students, right? I'm not, you can't ask most students to be political theorists, that, that's a tall order. But if you could ask them to say, what would Mencius say about New York City specialized high schools, right? So that New York City's specialized high schools are greater than 50% Asian American, the admission is, entirely determined by the SH, SAT, what would Mencius say about that? So I had a student this past week present on it and she was fired up. She couldn't wait to talk about it, right? And and really all you need is like, just do some research on the debate about New York specialized high schools, have a few quotes from Mencius and you're good to go. You're doing political theory. Uh, what would Aristotle say about the parents' rights movement in education? That uh, Plato says in the Republic abolish families, just too much trouble, right? Um, and Aristotle's critique of Plato is no, that that parents care about their children in a way that strangers never will. So you need to empower parents. So now we've got a way to, to talk about this you know, major platform of the Republican party trying to get parents involved in education, the parents' rights movement. Uh, what would W.E.B. Du Bois say about the coups in French Africa? So I, I teach a course on global justice and, and I have a student who is interested in sort of the, the turmoil in, in French Africa and what would Du Bois say about it? Perfect, we had, a great, we had a great discussion about this, about decolonization. So that's just my little tip about how to get students to do projects. You know, each of these things can be a student presentation, can turn into a thesis. Sometimes uh, if you choose the right authors and topic, it could be a, a dissertation or an academic article. So I think this is a pretty manageable way to get uh, students to be doing political theory. Uh, what's a practical tip to give better lectures? Again, you know, I'm so grateful that Edward Elgar gave me a chance to write this because I get to, you know, I've been thinking about it. So that uh, the, the punk rock guitarist, Johnny Ramone, he, he once said that when the Ramones performed, the advice he would have, he, the thing he would do is he would always perform to the back of the room. So I think that's I think that's a great tip. So when I give a lecture, I always look to the students in the back row and I always talk with them, right? And uh, that sometimes when you're doing evaluations of new teachers, that when you do peer evaluations for you know tenure and promotion, that sometimes students talk to a handful of students in the front of the classroom. And I get it, right? Those are the students who wanna participate. They've done their work, uh, their hands are up, they're ready to go. But I really think that you uh, wanna get everybody in the classroom involved. And so this Johnny Ramone's uh, piece of advice strikes me as uh, getting at that, right? Make eye contact with the kids. Don't let them look at their, I mean, I, I'm not a, I, if kids wanna look at their phones, I don't want to make a policy, right? I mean, Confucius. Every time you make a rule, you're giving students the idea to break the rule. So I don't, I don't like this. I don't like to have a big syllabus filled with rules and stipulations. But I think if you make the class engaging, students will participate and they won't look at their phones. That's my wager. And uh, here's my final slot. Uh, how can you teach the public? Uh, so I. I like teach. I mean, I love teaching uh, students, but every now and then I, you know, I watch the news and I say, ah, oh, people don't realize what James Madison said, right? That it's good that the governor is pushing back against the president, right? Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Somebody needs to teach the public that the American constitutional system 
is designed for there to be resistance to centralized authority. So often um, I get an idea to write an op-ed to bring ideas from political theory into the, to the, comp the, to the public. So op-eds have their own style. They're, they're 10 paragraph essays, 800 words. Can't do footnotes, can't do endnotes, gotta write short sentences. But you know, when you when it when you when you land, you're engaging lots and lots of people in doing political theory. So for me, that one part of the book is to teach, you know, give ideas to political theorists about how to convince their colleagues. But I also think that if we want to convince the public that political theory is a valuable thing, we have to show that we can actually speak intelligently about issues that care about, right? That we need to be able to, to chime in on, on debates about, um, you know, Supreme Court, uh, like free speech rights cases of, of, of terrorists. Like what are those, right? I mean, so Andrew has the New York Times op-ed and, right, these, these are very important. I think that these are, this is how we show people that political theory matters. And I discussed some, some examples. I mean, one example I wrote was uh, about Fortnite. Um, that that I was bringing Tocqueville in, his notion of individualism in, that people form little bubbles of people who are like them. That, that's what Fortnite does. People put their headsets on. And so they form communities, but they form communities of people who are very, very similar to them. And they're not generating the social capital that uh, Tocqueville says is necessary to forge democracies. And so this piece was, <clears throat> piece was taken up in Navy Times and Business Insider. And it was, I think it's been read for, it's been read a hundred thousand times, but there's a video of somebody reading and responding to it that's been watched 400,000 times. So the, the point is, is that I think political theorists need to find ways to reach the public. And I tried to share some advice about ways to do that. So conclusion, why did I write the book? I love political theory. Political theory has a complex relationship to political science. I wrote the political theorists, I wrote the book to help political theorists teach, just give some advice, some ideas, just, you know, it's, I did not write a textbook. I did not tell other people what to do. I just shared advice and hopefully some of it might give people advice. And I wanna figure out how to convince colleagues in political science and the broader ac academic community in the world that political theory is an important endeavor. That's my presentation. I look forward to the feedback from my colleagues. Hi, th thank you, Professor Timpio. And as a as a teacher in in a university teaching political philosophy for years, I benefit personally a lot from the from your your new book. And thank you. And let's welcome our first commentator, Professor Peng Yu. Uh, Peng Yu is an uh, associate professor of politics and international studies at. Uh, Erham College. His research operates at the intersection of political theory and Chinese studies. He is particularly interested in Zhuangzi's political philosophy and how everyday lived experience interacts with politics in informing us about contemporary Chinese society. His work has appeared in journals such as Theory, Culture and Society, Philosophy and Social Criticism, Journal of Chinese Political Science, Theory and Event, and a number of edited vol volumes. Uh, Professor Peng Yu, could you please com 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 control your, your limit your, your comments uh, into like within 10 minutes because Professor Tempio will, have, will respond to your, to your comments and questions. Thank you, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhu, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, I want to thank Professor uh, D'Ambrosio for inviting me. Uh, it's great to see uh, many colleagues and friends here, and it's my great pleasure and honor to be part of the discussion for today. And that it's also exciting for me to learn about uh, Sihai Weishu, the collaborative uh, learning project. A uh, number of years ago, I led a group of Earlham students to Shanghai, and we spent a day and. ECNU and uh, Hua Shida and uh, interact with the students and faculty in the political science department. It was a, a great experience and a wonderful memory. And then um, great to be back and you know working with ECNU and Sihai Weishu again. 
Um, and I think it, it provides a great platform for um, a scholarly exchange and conversations. And I also want to thank Nick for um, um, inviting me and in writing this wonderful project, working on this wonderful project, and congratulate Nick on publishing this book. Um, I really enjoy reading uh, this book. Uh, I have three very broad questions, and I think that Nick has already answered sort of my first question, which is about the definition of uh, political theory, uh, what political theory is. Um, and in this book, um, I'll just add that in this book, um, Nick has mentioned a broad range of uh, philosophical traditions. There's American political thought, um, Indian and Chinese political philosophy, there's Greek political philosophy, and the book has covered a wide and diverse range of topics related to the philosophical traditions. So how do you define political theory? And I really like the analogy you gave here, um, right, the flow of the oceans, right? You look, you would look at the events, the issues, right, the phenomena that actually interests the students, right, motivates them to study politics and political theory. And then you follow those uh, events and patterns and uh, to follow the flow of the ocean. I think that makes a lot of sense here. Um, and on the other hand, you also mentioned the great books, right? And you said that uh, uh, as political theorists, uh, we have the responsibility to sort of inherit the script books and then pass it on to uh, the the next generation of scholars and the students, right? So, so my question here is that, uh, uh, how do you define political theory in terms of right uh, the foundations? Right, um, how, does it have a foundation? And of course, you mentioned the great books; they constitute right uh, the foundation of political theory as a field, as a discipline. Um, but can this also be defined in terms of like we destabilizing this foundation? Right, because you mentioned a lot of traditions that were previously right traditionally excluded from. Uh, the study of political theory, right, uh, marginalized, etc. Um, so, how do you, right, uh, see the definition of political theory in terms of the foundation, the challenge to the foundation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? And one reason I really love teaching Zhuangzi in my political theory course is that, you uh, know, we usually don't begin with, you know, political events with Donald Trump or whatever. Uh, we begin with a giant bird, right, giant fish, and they transform into each other. And then at the end of the class, you know, I often get these questions from the students, like, what does this have to do with politics? Like, what does this have to do with political theory, right, if you're not talking about law and kind the of social contract, et cetera? So uh, I'm just curious about if you could add a little more to right, the definition of political theory in terms of foundation here, right? And my second question is about method. Um, the book has provided many examples of how the idea of political theory is conveyed to the students, right? You talk about design of the syllabus, creating uh, class activities, assignments, selecting materials for the readings. Um, so my understanding is that you are not only talking about teaching political theory, but also like providing a method and approach to political theory by way of teaching, right? So, um, so and 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 a lot of it talks about constructing comparisons across schools and traditions of, uh, of philosophy, um, and these comparisons are important to your right the pluralist approach that right? you're trying to uh, address in this book, and in your words. Um, I strive to exercise an ethos of pluralization that reaches out to constituencies that have not held center stage in Europe, American academic political theory. So my question is, is this approach, pluralist approach to political theory uh, in general, right? Or is it a, to uh, maybe a subfield, right? Uh, political theory, such as comparative political theory, right? Is it is this, these comparisons apply to political theory as a field in general, it would encourage more, you know, cross-cultural tradition conversations as such, or you think it's more, you know, something that a field like comparative political theory would, right, uh, try to promote and do here, right? So, um, and, and this is also something that I, um, try to reflect on often is um, I consider myself as comparativist. And uh, very often when we talk about comparative political theory, right, we quickly and automatically get siloed into monologues, 
right, of non-Western political thought. So we just basically talk to ourselves about, you know, the work of Zhuangzi or Confucius, right, um, this and that, and very rarely reach out to, you know, the the areas of our own and try to stage conversations across those traditions. So, and I think you've done a good job in this book in trying to put together those conversations. And I, I totally agree with you that we need more of those conversations here. So, um, so, um, so do you, so coming back to my question, the comparison, is it more like generally something that you want to apply to political theory or it's something that a comparative is to pay more attention to? And my last question here is, um, you mentioned some interesting areas, right, uh, that political theorists should pay uh, close attention to, such as neuroscience, uh, public policy. And, and also remember, I was listening to the podcast that you had with Lily Gorham, and you mentioned that if there's space, you would also add a chapter on economy, right? So these are the areas that probably the political philosophers would not pay a lot of attention to. Um, um, but you're mentioning that, you know, we could do more, right, to, you know, look into these areas and try to, you know, uh, figure out something interesting for us to do. Um, so, so my question is, in approaching political theory, can we start with issues, events, right, uh, and, and uh, the mundaneness of our everyday life? Can we, you know, start with an eth ethnographical study and living a space and to think about what kind of theory is this vis-a-vis uh, -vis ideas, reasons, logics, right? So in other words, uh, do you see political theory more as a sort of immersive practice rather than a result, an outcome of the abstract philosophizing, right? You would be, if you're interested in, right, uh, the protest in Hong Kong, right? You So you would be being there on the streets, right? Seeing people protest and, you know, like that. And then you come up with an idea about, you know, what uh, what kind of, you know, political thinking this is. And then you go to uh, uh, maybe readings to, to, to put together a kind of conversation. So um, is it more immersive act, immersive practice or, right? So, um, so, so these are my questions. I'll try to be brief and maybe elaborate later if there's time. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Peng Yi. Uh, Professor Tempio, could you please give your uh, feedback? Thank you. Yeah, those, those are those are wonderful questions and real and very generative. And and I appreciate that you gave me a chance to to elaborate. Um, and and I'll give the first answer, but I have a sense that you might want to ask follow ups to make sure I'm getting your question. So uh, to the question of what is political theory, um, with when you're doing students you don't want to explain too much about what you're doing. You just want to do it, right? You just want to wow them right away. They don't want to know how you do the magic trick. They just want to see the magic trick thing. So I don't, but we're, you know, we, we, we're we academic political theorists. We do this for a living. So I can tell you a little bit about my thinking of political theory. I, I think about it in a, uh, a Deleuzian terms and Oakshot. So the part I get from Oakshot is that political theory is a practice that the way you learn a practice is you watch people who are good at it. So uh, Paulina and I were at Johns Hopkins together. We, we were both on B level. We were both working very hard. She, I, she's still my model of how hard you should work in grad school. Paulina was just a fantastically hard worker. And we just, we just learned, we just watched people at the top of their game and we learned how to do it. And it was a province. We were in the province of Baltimore, so that we're a little bit provincial, but but maybe that's how all practices start. So I have a view of what political theory is and what it looks like. It's bizarre that in Western political theory, you're expected to write 35 paragraph articles. That's how we do political theory. That's what counts, right? 35 paragraph articles. Like that's weird that that we communicate our ideas that way, that it's 8,000 words, 9,000 words, 10,000 words, that we have certain number of citations. So these are all contingent, all somewhat arbitrary, but that's what I was trained in. That's what I trained my students in. So I, I don't know how you get around um, being somewhat parochial. I have a forthcoming book review in, um, constellations that talks about some of this that I think I think you have to embrace your parochialism a little bit but I'm also a Deleuzian in the sense that I want to open up 
to the plane of consistency that I think we should read major authors, we should read minor authors, we should read my minoritarian becomings. So whenever you look at my syllabi, what I try to do is have, well, of course you have to have those authors. Of course you have to have Plato and Aristotle. And then you, wait a minute, Sextus Empiricus, right? Now all of a sudden that's a minor author that not many people have, have heard about. And yet he's opening up onto uh, lines of flight that could lead in new directions. And, and there could even be more, there could often be the Greek tragedians, there can be Epicurus, there could be Stoics could go either way about, you know, where they are on the, the thing. So um, for me, political theory is a constantly evolving practice. The word tradition means handing over. So it's on the one hand, you're continuing, but it's also what a traitor does, what, what treason is, you're handing over the wrong things. So uh, for me, it's a it's an evolving practice, and so that yeah, I hope that answers some of your questions. Keep pass on the center of the tradition you've inherited, open it up a little bit, perforate, take a take a file and work on the borders and open it up a little bit. I, um, your second question, I'm not quite sure I understand it, so I'll give what I think is the, your question. Um, and I guess the question is, should all political theory be comparative? And I don't know if that's your question, but that's. Yeah, um, yeah, comparative, yeah. And, and I mean, I, Andrew, Andrew, I'll keep citing his work here, um, that his article, What is Comparative Political Theory? He says, all political theory has been comparative from its beginning, that that Aristotle is going all over, around the Mediterranean basin, looking at different constitutions, that that the, even the, the etymology of the word theory means what the Greeks would do when they would go a different village to see their re religious rit rituals. So, uh, I, right, so I think that all political theory is comparative. I think if, if the term comparative political theory does anything right now is that it's emphasizing you're trying to find authors outside of the North Atlantic. So out, outside of England and France and Germany and America. Um, so uh, that's why I like to do the journal of comparative political theory. I like to read non-Western political thought. I want to get other accounts of deeper flows that we, the journal just published an interesting article on Kang and Kang's theory of global justice. and. We're all familiar with Kant's. And so what the article did is it compared Kant and Kang on global justice. Super interesting article. I encourage everybody everybody to take a look at it. But I, I don't want to colonize political theory. I, I think uh, I have my traditions. There are other people who have other approaches. I don't really do analytic philosophy where you focus on a problem. I, I find it much better much, to focus on an author engaging a problem. So I'd rather do an engage, a Deweyan critique of national education standards than just pretend that I'm coming up with my own ideas about national education standards. So, um, and and I also like I also like reading things I'm reading. I'm very fascinated these days in the authors who are in Jena in 1800. So Hegel, Fichte, Schiller, the von Humboldt brothers that. You know, there were 4,000 people living in this little town in Germany in 1800, super provincial, but that's fine. I want to read that. And, and, and later on, I'll get to some non-Western political thinkers, but I think it's perfectly fine to, to follow your instincts on what to read. And, and sometimes it's just reading European authors. And, and to, the, to the final question, is political theory an immersive practice or is it more about abstract philosophizing? I... I find Nietzsche's distinction term, the untimely, very useful, that I think it's something to be said for doing timely political theory. Uh, I've sometimes been on CNN, I've been on television, I've debated politicians, I've met with politicians to talk about education policy. If the pandemic had not hit, I was all set to debate the um, the lead organizer of the Common Core State Standards Initiative. So very frustrated that that would have been my chance to be in Washington, D.C. at the center of the action. Uh, but uh, clearly, whatever. Uh, but I don't want political theory to only be that. I think there's something to be said for untimely political theory. I think, I think it's fine to write an academic article that you know very few people are going to read, uh, that you just try to sharpen your acts and 
ideally you'll bring that axe into uh, I'm in a bad metaphor now. I don't know what where you'll bring an axe, but uh, but you know you want to you want to basically figure out your ideas with specialists and then bring them into conversation with with other people. So I I think it's perfectly fine. You know, if I ever become an editor of a mainstream political science journal, I I, I want to publish a few articles that have people scratching their head that say, how did that make it into that 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 journal? So there's a there's a recent article in the American Political Science Review talking about how political theorists should discipline themselves with the concept of robustness, that we should be able to come up with. Uh, in, in, I, I, I need to make sure I, people can read an article, see if I'm being fair, but we need to figure out a way to measure whether the political theory is being accurate or not, or is fitting our considered convictions or not. And I think that some political theory lends itself to testing for robustness, but I think there's a lot of really interesting political theory that 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 seems like a very unfair demand that you have to allow political theorists to just go down rabbit holes, go down into the library, think about this hard question that interests very few people. Maybe in 10, 20, 30 years, the question will become timely. But I, I very much um, want political theorists to to think about these big questions and maybe withdraw from immersive practices. So, Punk, those are my first answers to your questions. Do you have follow up or? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Tempio and Professor Penyu. So now please let me to introduce our second competitor, Professor Paulina Ochoa Espel. Um, she is a professor of political science. She works at the intersection of democratic theory and the history of political thought. And she is interested in questions about popular sovereignty and borders. She has written about populism, the boundaries of the demos, immigration and the right to, right to exclude, the relation between democracy and territorial rights, the moral relevance of borders and, the, and broader control. She is also interested in Latin American political thought. Before joining the faculty at Haverford Hover College, she was an assistant professor at Yale University and a Lawrence S. Rockefeller visiting fellow at the University Center for Human Values, Princeton University. She has, she has been visiting professor at site in Mexico City and a Carey postdoctoral post fellow at the Amherst Institute in the University of Notre Dame. She was also a member of the School of, of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, and a recipient of the ACLS. Fred, Frederica Burhand Fellowship for for recently tenured scholars. So, so let me welcome Professor uh, Paulina and please also limit your uh, your discussion in within ten minutes, and then I'll ask Professor Tempio to respond. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Um, when I accepted the invitation uh, to be with you today, Professor D'Ambrosio, as, as he mentioned when we started, told me that this was not a traditional authors meet critics because you don't encourage criticism any more than agreement. And I have to say that this is relatively easy for me because I agree on so many things about this book. So I will begin with my agreements, but I will voice some criticism in the second part, or at least questions about why he did it this way when he could have done it differently. Yeah. So this is a very useful book and I couldn't agree more on many important ideas that Nick puts forward here. So I could not agree more with Nick about the need to engage profound or deep thinking about politics. Uh, I also agree with drawing from diverse traditions of thought and I admire Nick's willingness to engage with texts that come from times and places that he would not normally be expected to engage. And well, we, we are part of a wider movement in the field, it's still not as big as it should be, but it's a wide movement in the field to go beyond a narrow set of texts 
and reference. Um, I also couldn't agree more on his effort to spark pluralization through his work. Well, so uh, I think that we can both see the diversity of voices, uh, but we don't see them as different creatures in the zoo, but uh, something that you engage with people and it's an activity that creates new ideas and that they might be divergent among themselves. Also, like Nick, I'm deeply committed to the idea that we should teach students how to think for themselves. And uh, also, very importantly, the idea that you learn by doing. So I agree with all of these views, and I also admire many aspects of the book. I have no doubt that Nick is an excellent teacher. So like his books, I'm sure his classes probably lead by example. And this book is an example of thoroughness, of organization. You can see the discipline through it. And I'm sure that in class, he's committed, he's responsive, and he's supportive. All of those traits come through in the book. So my agreement, I have to tell you, I mean, Nick has already told you a bit about this. It's not surprising because I mean, I call him Nick because I have known him for a long time. We attended the same graduate programs in the early 2000s, and we were both uh, students of William Conley, Richard Flatman, and Anthony Pagden, among others, I guess. So we share a wealth of references, of themes, of authors, and discussions in our formative years. And for me, of course, this familiarity colors the way I read the book. I know the context and the characters that appear in the book personally and deeply. And I see things that may not be explicitly written in the text. So for example, in the last chapter, when he's discussing the habits of the arts of the self that are necessary for cultivating hair and clarity of mind, he mentions the restaurants in Florence where he ate his dinners during his time in Italy. And when I was reading this, I had this big laugh. I almost spit my coffee on the table because I remember Nick talking about this when he came back from Italy. And we have a common Italian friend who was shocked that he'd not spend time in Italy and he did not eat tomatoes. So he was like, what? what were you doing in Italy if you were not eating tomatoes? Anyway, this leads me to, to the second part of the discussion. It's not surprising that we agree. But it is quite interesting that having so many common references, we don't have more things in common, I think. I mean, it might be a testament to the program that created very different thinkers. But in the part dedicated uh, to, to the practice of political theory, he discusses some ways of doing it that he did not discuss in the book. And this include normative analytical political theory, political theory and ethnographic key, and uh, some aspects of political science. Those are precisely the ones that I practice <laughs> and, and others that he does not mention like critical theory in the Frankfurt style. So these differences of method are, I, I, are important because that it illustrates that teaching political theory could be very, very different from this. But I think that this is not so important for us today because he acknowledges that there's pluralism and the aspects of pluralization. What I do want to focus is on a, another uh, difference in the way we practice or approach comparative political theory. So Nick's approach is comparative, but I think it's a one-sided comparison that remains centered on canonical thinking in the United States, or um, as he calls it, the canon of major thinkers. So take uh, as an example, the, the, part, uh, the brief discussion of Latin American political thought in the book. I was surprised that this was added at all because it's added almost as an afterthought to a syllabus that is focusing on the history of political thought in the United States. So he cites Arturo Chang's essay. And what Chang wants to highlight is how the United States uh, in the 19th century, but also in the 20th, it includes a lot of people for whom the main references are Spanish and Spanish American. But uh, in the book, this looks as the discussion of Latin America is like an appendix to the history of the United States. So here I'm quoting, 
By assigning authors from Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, or South America, political theorists are teaching students that they should take an expansive view of what it means to be an American and the sphere of American politics. He's referring here to the fact that in the, the whole of Americans uh, are America, not only the United States. But when he says students, clearly he's thinking that students are students in a classroom in the United States. That is, he's centering the United States when he says students without any adjectives. But he's not very clear about this centering. He's not saying this is aimed at classrooms in the United States. And if one does this, there is a risk of universalizing the particular. Um, for example, another example of universalizing the particular is saying man when you refer to all human beings. By centering the United States and citing Latin American ideas only filtered by people who live in the United States and write in English, he makes Latin America an appendix of the United States. Just like for some people, universalizing and man make women and children an appendix or an unfinished version of man. So perhaps due to the power differentiality, like in China, Latin America does look like an appendix to the US, but uh, it is evolving in a different language, uh, in an independent tradition grounded in 500 years of history with its own authors, its own references and its own concerns. So this issue of centering the United States and making one-sided comparisons may be easier to grasp with a different example. So in, in the chapter on how to write lectures, Nick emphasizes that political theorists should ask some questions about a foreign thinker, including what is their view of human nature? Uh, and the reason why he likes the idea of human nature is because every major thinker addresses the topic of human nature. And he cites Locke and Freud and Maus and Heidegger as the scholars that address human nature. In the last few years, I've been thinking a lot about nature. What is nature? And I have confronted many ways of thinking about the distinction between nature and culture that would simply not fit the Enlightenment conception of human nature. The Mayan writers of the Popol Vuh, for example, who were clearly major thinkers in their own tradition, did not see a clear separation between nature and culture. To them, the idea of properties that are natural and properties that are acquired by will or by culture, which is structure Hobbes, Locke, or Rousseau's thought, would not make any sense. Um, so because they have a view of nature where people were often demigods or half beasts and where human nature did not play a big role, now, um, because they don't have a view of human nature, they will now become somehow a sideline to the major, to the major thinkers, to the not in the Deleuzean sense of minor, like in a minor key, like uh, opposing the center the way that uh, Nick uses, but they become lesser. So they are lesser to whom? Well, lesser to the canon that is created by those who center human nature and Locke and Freud and Maus and Heidegger. So this is the question. Why should we teach political theory by centering what is familiar to us? Shouldn't we make a comparison from other standpoints as well, like two-sided comparisons? Perhaps doing it one-sided is the easy way, but we always run the risk of mistaking our center for the universal. And then shouldn't, wouldn't we marginalize those with whom we don't understand as well? This is a very rich book. Uh, I have many other questions and I could have spent like all the time talking about it, but I know that the 10 minutes has passed and these are enough questions for today. So thank you, Nick, for your book and thank you all for your attention.
Wow. Well, that, that was really great, Paulina. Uh, that, that's hilarious that you picked up on that reference to uh, the macrobiotic restaurant in Italy. And yes, I'm sure Ricardo was shocked then and probably <laughs> now. So, um, yeah, no, you, you, you raise, you know, I'm really, um, thank you for, for saying the points of agreement and then sort of thanks for, for pointing out the, the concern. And, you know, it's a, it's a very, it's a very real concern and I, and I'm trying to negotiate it and you could tell me if I'm doing, clearly I'm not doing well enough. And, and see, part of the, part of my thinking is this, is that I teach uh, in New York city and I have my students who have certain concerns, right? That like most schools in America, the students largely come from within a hundred mile radius. And I live uh, in uh, right, right near Danbury, Connecticut. So when Thomas Jefferson wrote his famous letter to the Danbury Baptist, that's where I live, right? That there was a battle of the American revolution right down the street where David Wooster was shot, the one place that there was an inland battle in the United States, in Connecticut. And so, um, and with my children, I, I study Connecticut history. I believe with John Dewey that you study the near as an entryway to think about the far. So, uh, but you know, the fact is, is that you, you've got, you've got it exactly right that uh, I've only been to Texas once or twice for conferences. Uh, it's not, it's not a real issue for me. It's not an immediate issue for me the way that other issues are, that it's pretty much always mediated by television or newspapers or other people. And so the, the question is, is you, tr you have to figure out how are you going to expose your students to think farther than where they are? How do we, how do we press ourselves to think farther than where we are? So in, in an early uh, proposal for this book, one of the reviewers said, you've got a chapter on American political thought and nothing about the Haitian revolution. I said, wow, that's a, that is a fantastic point. And so I read CLR James, the, the, Jacob, the, the Black Jacobins, and uh, with my kids, I've read about the Haitian revolution. And in my American political thought class, I absolutely should have a unit on Haiti, but I don't. And, and the, the, the challenge is, is that if you, if you have a few paragraphs on Latin America or hemispheric political thought, then you're kind of guilty of tokenism that, that I, I don't know that tradition as well. So I have, I have a couple of pages and, but it, it's, maybe it's so shallow that it would have been better not to include it and just be more forthrightly provincial and just said, I, I I care about the Mexican border and above, uh, but I'm trying I'm trying to make the the principled point that we we always start where we are. That I've spent most of my academic career in New England, and thereby I have certain concerns that are much more lively and present for me. Right, I live not too far from Mark Twain's house. That that feels re real to me. That some of these Latin American authors that just it, it just any other author you read in a book who you don't met, I mean, you have every reason to believe that they're real, but they don't, they're not, not urgent uh, in the same way. But the most recent, the most recent art journal of comparative political theory had an article about political thought and race ideas in Brazil. And the, co the cover of the issue was Gilberto Freire. And um, it was also actually a controversial article because a lot of people wrote in, or some people wrote in. Uh, there was a whole thing on Twitter about saying that that Gilberto Freire's ideas were were very were pretty much racist. And I was had a long correspondence with some people, and I said I don't really think it's racist, but like you got to tell me what what you think. So um, I realized that I have I, I don't have a great response to you, Paulina. You're right. You know, you're right that that I should keep stretching myself. I don't know how fully. You can enter somebody else's point of view. Um, you know, I, I I think we're always a little bit egocentric. We're always concerned about our own frame of references. I mean, if I was truly going to make things equal, I'd be reading these authors in Spanish and maybe teaching in Spanish. Like, and, but but I I don't know. I I think I just have to just say, the best we can do is we can open ourselves up, but we we still have to preserve our identity. Can, can I do a, a small follow-up? Yeah? Yes, please. Do you have a second? Um, I, I, I agree. I mean, you can't take yourself off yourself. 
Uh, but I think it's quite important to remember that you're that you're setting the canon. The can that's what canons do. They create the center. So by by making the canon, um, you are um, sort of making the major and the minor. So for example, New York yeah, agree. You know, like uh, New York has that all that history. I live in Philadelphia, but it's full of it's full of Latinos who are also from here. So um, part of the point here is that um, they they will always feel marginal to to their place where they live, right? They are marginalized from 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 the currents. So the, the problem is like the point is not become an expert on everything. the The point is not to to center something without making it obvious so that we don't universalize um without noticing but i think that you do i mean I, i'm i'm very impressed by by how much you get into other views and i think that it's fantastic to have a a book that doesn't say you know comparative anywhere it says teaching political theory so in that i'm super um i'm in i'm in the most agreement i'm working with the idea that we are not doing something special. We are teaching political theory. It's not a special course for the people in, in the third year who wants to specialize in something odd. We are doing center political theory and this is how you do it. So I'm I'm full on with you. I guess the disagreement less than the comparative political theory now that I think about it and after your response, it's more about the canon than about than about the the comparison, right? It's about making canons and having majors, major and, and minor thinkers, not necessarily in the Deleuzean sense, but in the 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 good ones and the bad ones. And and so I guess that that's where it's going. But in any case, thank you so much for for inviting me. I really enjoyed reading the book and being here today. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you, thank you, Professor Paulina, and. Uh, uh, Tempio is great. And please let me introduce our third commentator, uh, Professor Andrew March. Professor Andrew March is a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. His research and teaching interests are the, in the area areas of political philosophy, Islamic law, and political thought, religion and the political theory, and a comparative and non-Western political theory more generally. His first book, Islam and, and the Liberal Citizenship, The Search for an Overlapping Consensus, is an exploration of the Islamic juridical discourse on the rights, loyalties, and obligations of Muslim minorities in liberal politics and won the 2009 Award for Excellence in the Study of Religion from the American Academy of Religion. His second book, The Caliphate of Men, The Inv Invention of Popular Sovereignty in Modern Islamic Thought, in examines the problem of divine and popular sovereignty in modern Islamic thought through the Arab Spring. He has published the articles on Islamic law and political thought, secularism, religion, and free speech, religious freedom, and the boundaries of marriage in liberal society. Please let's, let me welcome Professor Andrew Marsh and please give us your uh, discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much for that kind introduction. <clears throat> Thanks to Nick for this uh, wonderful occasion to discuss this book. <clears throat> um, I join with Paulina in complimenting the book and commending it <clears throat> and in expressing my confidence that Fordham and its students are very, very lucky to have Nick as a student. And the exchange with uh, Paulina just sort of reminded me <clears throat> of one of the things that I've long admired most about Nick, <clears throat> which is that while he's not afraid to go against the sort of presumed consensus of his tribe and his peers on all kinds of issues, uh, he's also very exemplary in taking criticism. I don't know whether it's because of his career as an amateur boxer or what, but Nick knows how to take it on the chin uh, with grace and gratitude. And so I think that is a skill that um, 
many of us could could stand to learn from Nick as well as his uh, uh, lessons on pedagogy. Uh, I want to steer the direction in a slightly um, different way. I want to uh, ask a few questions about <clears throat> some of the sort of um, mechanics of teaching political theory. <clears throat> and um, I want to ask four different kinds of questions. And there are things that I am always trying to uh, think about <clears throat> and improve upon and uh, sort of fine tune or tinker with. Uh, the first is that um, you know, I like Nick's metaphor of the waves versus the tides versus the current. <clears throat> and I like uh, this idea <clears throat> of trying to use real world events and um, uh, perhaps certain kinds of public facing articles <clears throat> um, uh, uh, to sort of pique students' interest and sort of draw them into the practice of political theory. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to give Nick a chance to talk a bit more about uh, his experience doing this and what kind of real world problems or public facing writing sort of, you know, five to 8,000 word essays and um, not in academic journals, but in, um, you know, popular media or, um, you know, journals like the Atlantic or the New Yorker or the London Review of Books <clears throat> um, have worked best for him. What are the sorts of uh, works that have not only sort of done the best job of getting students to sit up and pay attention um, and, uh, you know, become engaged with the problems, but also to um, be persuaded that there are certain kinds of public problems uh, and public problems of a moral, social, political nature that are not just matters of opinion or not just matters of your preference or your existing views, <clears throat> but are things that can be studied systematically in a disciplined way. And that political theory is the way <clears throat> uh, to teach them to do that. I'll just uh, put some of my cards on the table. <clears throat> One essay <clears throat> that I have really, really enjoyed assigning to introductory political, to uh, 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 intro political theory students is uh, Amiya Srinivasan's Is There a Right to Sex? Uh, the issue, the, you know, the version that first came out in the London Review of Books, and not only because it's about sex, and not only because it's written in a way that drags a lot of younger students into talking about different kinds of uh, forms of desirability or dating apps or things like that, because it really um, is a way in which you can now go back and ask students <clears throat> at the beginning of the class and the end of the uh, uh, of the class, what did Rousseau help you understand about this? What did Aristotle help you understand about this? What did Marx or Catherine McKinnon or something like that? So that's one that's really worked well for me. And um, I'd like to hear Nick say more about his experience with that. Uh, the second thing is something I often struggle with. I'm reminded of that old adage that's been uh, attributed to everybody from Cicero to Voltaire to uh, Montaigne to Mark Twain that... I'm writing you a long letter because I don't have time to write you a short letter. And one thing that I struggle with is getting readings down to an appropriate amount. This generation doesn't know how to read. It doesn't read um, maybe even our own capacity for prolonged concentration uh, is diminished. I've now taken to uh, sort of offering one credit honor seminars in which we just read one book over 14 weeks. And so, uh, but in a political theory class, particularly an intro or a two or 300 level one, where you're trying to cover everything from Aristotle to the Haitian revolution, to Du Bois, to feminism, you know, it's very hard to, you know, you can't assign whole books, maybe, you know, Locke's second treatise or the social contract or something, but, um, and the quip is relevant because it's very easy to assign 150 pages. <clears throat> it's much harder to assign the right 20 pages of Du Bois or, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, Rawls or McKinnon or something like that. So <clears throat> maybe Nick had some thoughts on, you know, the challenge of finding, you know, the right uh, sort of uh, uh, value for uh, uh, quantity of pages to, uh, uh, class discussion and um, uh, learning goals. 
<clears throat> the third, and I Nick mentioned this briefly in his introductory remarks, but I want to I want to get more um, uh, out of him. The third thing that I've sort of been struggling with recently is feeling a little bit dissatisfied with my own assignments. You know, um, you know, we're all now here in our mid to late forties, and you know, I think we we can all remember at least the three of us that are the 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 the, uh, the, the American participants here, American broadly understood, Paulina. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember a uh, the internet came into existence after I began my college career, okay? Never mind smartphones and never mind things like this. And so, you know, I'm, I'm still sort of assigning three essays a term, five to 10 pages, or sometimes now weekly writing assignments. And I'm feeling a little bit like I'm missing opportunities <clears throat> to be more creative and thoughtful about, you know, what kinds of graded and ungraded assignments um, you're asking students to do that are that are uh, conducive to training them in political theory. And so Nick, with all of his expertise, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure has some thoughts about that. <clears throat> the fourth, um, and this is a little bit administratively driven. <clears throat> um, I don't know what Haverford or Virginia or, <clears throat> um, or Fordham are like, but at some universities, there's a lot of emphasis <clears throat> on um, on uh, you know using syllabi as a place to stress learning goals <clears throat> and learning outcomes and what exactly are students getting out of this. <clears throat> um, being now at a state university and having served <clears throat> in all kinds of levels of um, uh, service and administration, <clears throat> one of the things that I think is a little, and I think Paulina and I will, will, rep, will uh, um, appreciate the irony of this, <clears throat> I think that the area in which there is most vertical scrutiny of faculty is in trying to get syllabi <clears throat> approved. And so we will get syllabi <clears throat> sent back from the faculty senate three, four times because of little micro nitty gritty picky things, <clears throat> whereas tenure and promotion cases will just fly through uh, with hardly any kind of uh, <clears throat> serious, serious sort of scrutiny. So uh, I'm now thinking a lot more and, you know, in some cases, you know, I think this is true for all universities, <clears throat> you know, we're in a, I, I, I don't want to use the term neoliberal because everybody uses it and it's a little, and it's a little bit sort of thought killing, I think, as opposed to thought, uh, provoking, <clears throat> but, you know, we live in a, you know, in, in most places are resource scarce <clears throat> and in many places, faculty are competing, for students and they're competing for enrollments and they're competing for student credit hours and majors. <clears throat> and sometimes, uh, you know, there's also an emphasis on recruiting certain kinds of students, uh, women, students of color. <clears throat> so there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, what are you, what are students getting out of a class in theory? <clears throat> and, you know, one, one answer to that is the content. Well, you know, they're going to learn to really think about settler colonialism, and they're really going to learn to think about the Haitian revolution and, and hemispheric uh, conceptions of, of race and democracy and all that. <clears throat> but then, you know, you could also say, well, you know, many students are going to take one or two theory classes at most and go on to do other things. What is it that we are offering them at the level of skills and learning outcomes <clears throat> that's not necessarily defined in terms of content. So I wanted to give uh, Nick a chance to say something about that. And then my final question, I said I was going to have four and I really have five. <clears throat> um, uh, and, uh, and, and here's my version to uh, give him the Paulina treatment. I was shocked <clears throat> and I was scandalized and I was outraged at your lenience on the cell phone policy. <clears throat> How dare you? Uh, uh, have such a lenient approach to them pulling out their cell phones in class. <clears throat> and, I'm, and I'm joking partly, but I don't think that if you build it, they will come. If you are dynamic and, um, and engaged and they'll put away their cell phones, that's nonsense, right? <clears throat> uh, and so I go back and forth <clears throat> between having no laptop policies and not giving a shit, right? Just saying, you know what? <clears throat> You're paying. If you want to pay attention, you pay attention. Uh, and so, um, 
Uh, you know, the other thing is, you know, we're often assigning readings online. So we're asking them to read online as opposed to buying books. <clears throat> but then we'll say here now, I want your laptops closed or certainly your phones put away. <clears throat> so I want to ask Nick about his experience with tinkering with different ways of engaging students in class, you know, not through being awesome, like Nick obviously is, <clears throat> but through different kinds of uh, policies. Uh, one of the things that we're talking a lot about is a kind of crisis in student attendance, you know, particularly since COVID, <clears throat> um, you know, very often, you know, I mean, and this is, <clears throat> again, I, I am right now serving on a number of uh, college wide committees. <clears throat> so colleagues from departments all across the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, everybody's reporting this, right? A crisis <clears throat> in students just coming to class <clears throat> and, uh, and so, and, and in some ways, it's kind of a political theory question, right? To what extent do we rely on virtue or do we rely on voluntary participation or the cultivation of virtue as opposed to rules or incentives or things like this? <clears throat> and so, you know, I go back and forth between saying <clears throat> I show up and I do my job and it's not my job to corral <clears throat> every possible student to the other side saying, well, you know, my job is creating incentives, creating rules. Uh, uh, providing uh, uh, reasons for them to try to get as much out of this as possible. <clears throat> and so, again, I, I don't know if Fordham has this issue. I don't know whether, you know, these are all very diligent students that have very, very strong, uh, you know, sort of senses of uh, obligation. But uh, anything about just kind of the mechanics of um, tinkering with in-class rules to make sure that for 50 minutes at a time or an hour and 25 minutes at a time, uh, students have uh, certain kinds of either obligations or incentives to be present, <clears throat> to be undistracted, to be respectful, to pay attention, or whether that's something that we have to let slide. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity, <clears throat> and congrats on such an engaging book. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Andrew. A whole different set of questions, and I really, I really appreciate those. I, I would be very wary of, of giving any general advice about how to tell faculty how to intervene in public affairs. There are plenty of first rate scholars who don't do any uh, intervention in public affairs and I want them to keep doing what they're doing. And I don't feel like um, just for things like tenure and promotion, I'm very wary of counting public facing work, uh, even though I do it. I think that that scholarship is for scholars. You should write for peer review and. If a dozen people are the audience, that's just the way it is. Um, but just from my own experience, I really found it very satisfying to be part of the Common Core debate and about national education standards, because I think that a lot of people, especially Democrats, they see the value of nationalizing education, that, that sort of the 1954 case of Brown versus Board of Education, the 1957 Little Rock case where Ike sent in the 101st Airborne, that a lot of Democrats have just taken for granted that the federal federal government is the good guys in education. And I really felt like my job was to remind people of the arguments of James Madison and Alexis de Tocqueville, Sheldon Rowland, Deborah Meyer, all of these people were just emphasizing the importance of letting communities set education aims. So I felt like that was where something, I can contribute something that I'm drawing upon. What's funny, it's like it's the center of American political thought, the canon, and yet you're making a very counterintuitive argument, an argument that's really shocking people and surprising people. And so for me, that's that, that was a very satisfying way. Um, and I'm sure other political theorists will have their own experiences. But for me, that was one where I felt like I can actually elevate the conversation, get people, a general audience thinking about the big philosophical issues. To the, to the question of the appropriate amount of reading, I think for the syllabus, one article, one chapter is the right amount, right? I think more than that is going to, you're gonna be losing students. So one chapter, yeah. May, but you know, if you're at a really good school, like Haverford or, or UVA, maybe you can get away with two, but I, I want to do much more than that. I think in a, in a class, there's only so much you can discuss. And if you find the right article or the right chapter, that, that should be enough to go for. Um, I, I disagree with, my wife and I have an argument about this, right? She was a star student in college and she says, you should make your students read. And I say, I don't know how. And I think that uh, in class, I really try to make the class self-contained. I, there are going to be students who just don't do the reading, 
and I don't want them to fail the class. And in fact, I I just think about myself if I was in a biology or a chemistry class, I, I, I wouldn't want the teacher to be a jerk, right? I'd want them to help me out. And especially if it's a required class, I don't want, I don't want to make them to suffer from taking my class. So what I what really where I am right now is in class, I say, I'm gonna assume the students haven't done any of the reading. And one thing I'll do is I'll just find one passage or maybe a, a few quotes and that will be enough for the discussion. So I teach intro to political philosophy right now, and I teach the Butcher Ding story. So it's a very famous uh, few pages in, in the Jawangsa. Really, I pull up on the screen three paragraphs, and I say, I'm, today we are just going to understand these three passages. And then I walk through and I say, this is Ted Slingerland's interpretation. It's all about self-help. It's not really about politics. It's just, you got a job to do, practice till you get perfect. Okay, now I'm gonna do, um, Pung Yu's speech about how it's sort of a sign that good politics shouldn't face resistance from the public. If you're if you're hitting bone, then and that maybe that should be a sign that the politics aren't working, right? And then and you just keep going through these different things. And and so you know where I am right now, Andrew, is you're right. Students don't read. Um, I could fight that or I could just say, listen, I'm gonna show you why reading this paragraph is very closely is gonna pay off in all sorts of different ways. You're gonna be able to say you understand Jawangsa. You're gonna be able to have a clue about contemporary politics in China and the United States and other places. So that that's what I do. So just general less is more. Um, assignments. I don't know how chat GPT is going to affect our profession. It's very, disheartening that plenty of my exam questions, chat GPT could answer perfectly fine. And I have, I don't have a solution other than having in-class essays. In general, I just, I think, what would the author say about a current event? You know, try it, see if it works because it's it's a manageable assignment that if, they, if they're gonna become future political theorists, they can do it. If they're just suffering through the class, as long as they can understand one idea and it's application to one case, they can do it. Um, so that that's my general advice. Yeah, I I really I really hate the idea of administrators micromanaging syllabi. I I hate that syllabi have to have boilerplate language in them right now. I'm a full professor at a private university. I have a little I have a thing that says for university policies, please see this link. You know that that there are plenty of faculty who have 12 page syllabi where where eight of it is university policies on what you're supposed to do if you're feeling depressed or or pronouns or or various other things, which I'm not saying are not aren't important, but I think that there's I think that one of the earliest meanings of academic freedom is the freedom to make your own syllabus. And I don't know how phil how faculty lost that power. I want to regain that power. Um, and uh Learning outcomes, I think, can be okay. I mean, the learning outcomes that I say are, you learn how to, to practice public speaking when you give your presentation, you learn how to write about complicated topics, you learn how to read difficult material, you learn about the history. Now, I have other ones about the content, which you learn about the history of ideas, you learn how to engage non-Western political thinkers. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm bothered by that. And, and it's it's a bummer that, that that's the area where the administrators choose to scrutinize. I Academic freedom means hands off my syllabus. Uh, and then the final question is about cell phone and attendance and these other things. And, and maybe if I was, maybe if I was suffering more, I would give you a different answer. But students come to my class you know, again, it's a special, you know, it's New York private school paying a lot of money and made the pretty good students. So, so maybe it's not representative, but when, uh, when Paulina and I were at Johns Hopkins, I remember, uh, I believe it was the Dean, Stephen David, he gave a talk to, to professor or to graduate students teaching their first course. And he, his advice was treat your course. Like it's the most important course that students are going to take, take your, treat your, or treat your subject like it's the most important thing that students can study in college. And you know, every now and then I get funny emails from students like, I'm so sorry, professor, that I was sick. I really miss bad, feel bad about class. Like, and I think the reason that I get some of these notes is because they they just sense that I think the subject's very important. And they 
they get pulled into the drama of the course. I try to stage my courses where they've got a point, where there's a, a story being told, where there are good guys and bad guys and conflicts and, and, uh, and, and there's a narrative to the course. So if you miss a class, it's like you miss five minutes of a movie. I mean, you can make sense of it, but the more classes you miss, the harder it is gonna to be to make sense of the story. So I don't know if this is a generalizable thing. Um, kids are suffering for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, but there's a until I'm absolute until it's absolutely necessary, I would avoid doing punitive measures. I I would keep the onus on yourself for as long as possible. I'm just going to make this the best class I can. Thank you, Professor Nicholas Tempio and Professor Andrew March is great. And per, per, it's my time now. Personally, I love the message. Professor Tempio offered here that let's ask authors the same question and compare answers. I love this method very much because it's not teaching the history of a political philosophy or political thought. Mm, students won't like it's not will not that be interested in this kind of teaching from Aristotle to Kant to like this. But when Asking when you do this, like uh, ask authors the same questions and compare the answers is in actually in introducing students to think about the questions. And probably they already have this kind of questions and they are thinking this uh, these uh, questions and um, they have some answers to this or they don't. But when they compare, the answers they are thinking why they think why they the these philosophers in the history are thinking different differently and they they will choose they will choose which one or which ones are more convincing and that's a very good way of of learning and they are doing comparison themselves and they are thinking themselves so i i love this method thank you very much and before I advance to the question for audience, I, I would love to share some comments of uh, this book I, I, learned, I, I learned from the internet. Uh, please let me read some of this. In teaching political theory, Nicholas Tempio shows how political theorists may take a pluralistic approach to help students investigate the deepest levels of political life. The book shares advice about how to design a political theory course, including selecting reading materials, writing lectures, making assignments, and creating ex experience for students. More than a how-to manual, the book also shows how political theories may profitably stage conversations between American, Chinese, European, and Indian political thinkers. After reading this book, political theorists will gain ideas about how to read and teach Asian skeptics, Chinese toys, toys like John's African American philosophers and Indian philosophers. So this book is a rich, a rich book for, especially for young scholars like me uh, to how to teach political philosophy. Thank you so much. So now we have some time for, for the audience. The audience may ask questions and, and please let the Professor Nicholas Tempio to respond. Thank you. And let me see. Do we have any questions here? The audience, again, if you have uh, questions, you can just turn on your, your mic and ask here. So, uh, hi, Nick. Um, probably a comment or a question from your young colleague at the Lincoln Center campus. So, um, um, I really admire uh, the 
pluralistic approach of teaching political theory. I think this is what Fordham is doing. Um, but I but I feel that um, a lot of discussions about uh, kind of um, expanding the canon in the American context is, um, so there is a um, center and uh, that central tradition is uh, American or European or maybe kind of the Atlantic tradition. So um, many research and teaching on kind of a pluralistic or comparative political theory is uh, we individually actually kind of um, uh, build some dialogues between a Western thinker and uh, one non-Western tradition. So, um, but um, at Lincoln Center campus, my experience is um, in my class, we actually don't have a majority, ethnic major majority. It's just like uh, my classes are always like a mini United Nations. Um, and um, so my experience of teaching political theory here uh, at Lincoln Center is usually the conversation is not about Western canons versus non-Western canons. It's actually about um, different minority traditions engaging in dialogue with each other. Um, so I, I wonder kind of uh, what you can say about this. Do you think this should represent the future of political theory, teaching and research, um, or maybe this is just a New York thing. Because I, I, I actually highly enjoy this. Um, I feel that um, I, I have asked a lot of students why you take my class on Chinese political thought and uh, comparative Asian political thought. And they say that um, because we, we want to understand the world. We want to understand other non-Western traditions. So uh, it seems like kind of uh, those students, um, unlike other students that I taught at very elite level universities. So uh, for example, at Princeton, um, probably before coming to Princeton, they already had some ideas about the uh, so-called Western tradition. Whereas uh, Fordham students at Lincoln Center, most of them grew up in New York. Um, actually before coming to college, they didn't have any ideas about so-called Western tradition. So uh, teaching those students um, is a completely different experience than kind of teaching students with uh, some kind of Western core at, in mind. Um, so I don't know kind of how to formulate a question, but this is just kind of sharing sharing experience with you. So uh, probably you would have some thoughts or suggestions about. about yeah, no, this. that's. No, well, for, you know, first off, first off, I'm really grateful you're at Fordham and, and teaching Confucian political thought. And I'm sure, you know, I often tell my students, if you're interested in this, take this with Dong Xian, who's much more of an expert in, in Chinese political thought than I am. But but your question is, is that I would say that very few college students show up at college knowing about the traditions of political thought, right? So there would be no reason for them to especially know a lot about 18th century French political thought or 19th century German political thought, right? So, and and certainly if uh, there are plenty of students who would just like to learn more about Asian, East Asian political thought. So I guess the question we have to ask is what do we think is the is going to help us, uh, help us teach our students things that will be valuable to them? I mean, maybe a little bit of cultural capital. So maybe it's good to know the names of, of certain authors and stuff like that. But I don't I don't want it to just be that. I, I say I've got one semester, maybe more if they take classes to teach these students how to think about politics and how am I gonna find the best authors to help them do that. And so I think that, for example, I, uh, uh, I was during the right after George Floyd was murdered. I had a student who was having a very, very difficult time concentrating in class, was very angry to be reading white people, to be honest. That was the student's uh, mindset at the time. And and I was trying to explain, you know, is this a problem? Is this a problem of like the local? Is this a local problem? Is it a is this a problem that should be remedied at, by the state? Is it a thing that should be remedied by the federal government? Well, if you're thinking about these questions, you need to read Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison because their thinking is 
incredibly profound for thinking about the federal system and which level of federal government should handle which problems. I mean, the, the American founders, I mean, that's that's why we read them now. So yes, we want to understand the history of America, but they also really were thinking very deeply about, do you want the near person or the far person to solve your political problems? So I, um, you, you know, I, I, I think you have to figure out which authors are going to be the best to help the students think about the things that you want to think about. I still like a lot of the great Enlightenment, European Enlightenment philosophers. I don't think we have to be ashamed for teaching them. I actually get kind of bothered that right now in the academic job market, it's very hard for somebody who does American or European philosophy to get jobs. Um, that, that bothers me. I think we, I, I, when I came up, I was part of my milieu, a bunch of us were Kant scholars. I think it'd be very, very difficult to get a job in academic political theory right now as a Kant scholar. And I think that's sad. So uh, I don't you know, I, I, I don't know if I have a, a response to your to your comment, but uh, I think I think it's good for authors to teach different different syllabi and different authors, and uh, and I still find it very very valuable to to teach North Atlantic authors. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do we have more questions? Pauline, I could tell you were thinking about something. What were you thinking about? <laughs> um, funny that you asked me a question. <laughs> no, I, I was actually thinking too, I, I, what I had in mind was um, about the kind of questions that we ask. And, and I, you know, like this is something that Andrew was talking about when he was wondering uh, the kind of assignments and what do we do with the internet and what do we do with the artificial intelligence? And uh, what I tell my students is like, look, it's like things are going to change, but it's probably like uh, when in the 19th century, like painters or people in art school were confronted with with photo photography. You know, it's like, of course, you know, being a very, very good draftsman or a person that did uh, pictures for informative purposes is stopped being something important. And you got, uh, on the one hand, you got people like... Uh, Picasso painting completely different versions of what reality is like. Uh, and then on the other hand, you got artistic photography, you know, Andrew knows about this. So um, what people use the tool to create different forms of art. And so what I tell my students about artificial intelligence, the good thing now will be to, to ask good questions. So I think that the assignments, like you put a lot of emphasis on having people think for themselves. I think that um, um, I think that you you know so much about pedagogy, and and I think a lot of uh, you know Dewey and thinking and other people and educators in the 20th century put a lot of emphasis on let's ask our own questions. Um, so I I think that that's well I I try to do that with my students. It's hard. You know, like uh, their assignments are, you design your own question. And I don't care so much about the answer as I care about the question. You have to do a lot of reading to ask your own questions. And also that centers your own thought, you know? So that's what I was thinking about. And thank you for, <laughs> thank you for asking me a question. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's one thing I, that's another teaching tip I call on eyes. If I if I see students' eyes bugging, that's that's the students I call. So even if their hands are down, <laughs> there's another technique. <laughs> yeah, thank uh, Panina. And do we have do we have more questions from the audience? Oh. Uh, I think Professor Payne, you have more. Do you have, do you sure, have more yeah. questions? I can see from your uh, eyes. <laughs> come up with a follow-up question here. So um, uh, Nick, you mentioned um, when you're teaching and lecturing, you always pay attention to you know uh, uh, the students who are in the back row. 
right? Yeah. So you're uh, trying to engage them, trying to bring their attention to the lecture and the discussion. And I feel like it's one thing that's most difficult to do. And I actually don't know what to do <laughs> sometimes about these students. I don't know if I should intervene because there's there's also a kind of, a, I don't know, like autonomous state of trying to <laughs> keep away <laughs> from maybe they're not engaging or the rest of the class. Um, I don't know if you have more to say. Um, and you mentioned this in the, in the, in the book, so. Yeah, I, um... I think I, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the example I just had in class the other day um, to try to to try to give a, a concrete example of it. But I mean, I think that you try to find a quest. I think there's a lot of art to finding the right sized question. That if you if you find the right question, that the students will run with it and want to talk about it. One legacy I've used from the the pandemic era when we were all teaching on Zoom is I uh, I have students get into small groups to talk about things. And so sometimes if I ask a really good question is, uh, so for example, I was just teaching Han Feitza and Han Feitza was saying that if, uh, if, you, if, if somebody does more than their share or less than their share, you kill them. And it's a very counterintuitive idea that and then I ask my students what they think. And I say, I right, just tell the person next to you what you think. And, you know, in the olden days, it was a problem when students would talk to other students during class. But I think right now I see the value in allowing students to have a good, a good question. Um, and another thing I do is that if there's an assignment that I think the students can do well on their computers, I, I let them do on their own. So I teach a course on education policy and I say, I want you all to, rather than give me write the lecture, I want you to just figure out what's the difference between Biden and Trump on charter schools. Okay, you have 10 minutes, you all have your laptops or phones, go see what you can find. Now all of a sudden you have all these kids studying and reading, right? And there's nobody, you know, they know when we come back together, I'm just going to randomly call on a few students. So they have to do it. They have to be prepared. They don't want to be embarrassed. Not, I really make a point not to embarrass students, but you know they want to do a good job. They want to keep the conversation going. So I leave and uh, I often hear a loud roar coming out of my classroom. And I really love that. I really love student everybody talking and, and doing things together. And there's sort of a a social contagion. People are excited to to be there. So I want my I want my classes to be almost like parties. Almost like it's just you can't wait to be there and be part of it. And you're talking about something that matters to you. And it's the future of yourself. It's the future of Western civilization that that's at stake in in some or glo the global civilization that's at at stake with things. So. I, I can't I can't give you a recipe, right? There's a point from Michael Oakeshott that you can't use a cookbook to to do something like teaching. You just have to feel the room. You have to feel the chi, the energy in the room as people are are talking. But try to find good questions and ask the students to talk with their friends about it. Thank you. I feel like I'm prying open your toolbox and trying to steal the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was I was excited when they asked me to write this book. I was like, yes, excellent. I've been thinking about these things for 20 years. Here's, here are a lot of them. Do you guys have any teaching tips? I mean, I'll, I'll put you back on the spot. Andrew, I mean, do you have any tips for, for teaching that I haven't thought about? No. Come on. Come on, you've thought of, you've thought of everything. Don't, don't, uh, don't be silly. Do you have a favorite author to teach? Uh, recently, Catherine McKinnon. Oh, really? Yeah. <clears throat> do the students like? Do the students like her? They react very strongly to the <clears throat> um, purity <clears throat> of a certain kind of view about what divides the world and what it's actually about. <clears throat> so it <clears throat> grabs their attention and makes them really think with something. Yeah. How about you, Pung? Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite author to teach? Uh, I would always say uh, John, but but also Nietzsche. I think it's also um, just blow the students' mind and then try to, <laughs> um, keep them busy figuring out what this crazy person are <laughs> is talking about. So and relate which, to their lives, and so. Which text by Nietzsche do you teach? 
Um, we, we so we were talking about uh, the idea uh, where you know uh, in a situation where if you think you're running away from the class and then you know trying to party very hard, uh, now working on your final exams and you're not a loser because you know, Nietzsche says that you enjoy your life and then um, there's there's a lot of uh, um, 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 across a select selection of texts we talk about uh, Nietzsche, but put Nietzsche in conversation, for example, with other folks such as uh, Drons, I feel like really sort of get the students start talking about how politics and political theory is related to their life. I feel like the students are most passionate talking about these texts when they feel like there is a connection with their life, like why I'm partying so hard, there's there got to be reason for my life and, you know, and it's political. So it's not just about life, but it's political. So. Which text by Nietzsche do you assign? Um, the one that we were looking at um, um, is um, uh, uh, I'm just looking at my uh, syllabus. It's been a um, been a while that we. If if you're um, teaching Nietzsche, what would be your um, uh, some of well, the texts? I, 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 I taught. I taught the genealogy of morality for years, but then I just felt like I said every, I got everything I could get out of it, so I just I moved on. and And now, now my intro to political philosophy course is half Chinese, so I've I've total it's a totally different thing from when I started my career. Paulina, how about you? What's your do you have a favorite author to teach nowadays? I I usually start my intro with Hobbes, and we spend a lot of time reading Hobbes, and we have a lot of fun. Yeah, okay. so I, I do enjoy it because they're like new, they just arrived and uh, they're usually like freshmen and, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, it's difficult, but it's quite like we engage a lot and, and we enjoy that one a lot. So I, I've always enjoyed teaching Hobbes. Really, yeah. that's funny because, you know, we were both Flatman students, but I've, I've, I've taught, I, I started teaching a little Hobbes and I stopped. Maybe I should go back. Is it, is it deep? I mean, it feels to me like it's, it just feels to me like superficial and, and vague. <laughs> superficial, it helps. I don't know. It's just people are scared. They want the government to protect them. I feel like it's like. A... Oh, Nick! Come I, on, I hope... that's what you got out of Hobbes. Hobbes I hope is that you're not being serious. <laughs> metaphysical and revol uh, and 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 psychological revolution over Aristotle. You think as a Strauss guy that you keep on saying. So my favorite thing, apart from McKinnon talking about who fucks and who gets fucked, which is what grabs the student's attention, is to teach them Aristotle. The good has a meaning. Uh, persons are oriented towards the good. People have a hierarchy in their soul and their desires, virtue. And then it's like bizarro Aristotle where every single thing in Aristotle is reversed. All we are is our last desire. All we are is impulse. All we are is a reaction to certain sorts of things. Everything you can see as a kind of um, of bizarro Aristotle, and that's what flows. For, that's that's what the uh, protect us from each other uh, flows from. Is this idea that you can't create a hierarchy of desires or a conception of the good? Because all that is good is what the last thing that we called good, the last thing that we wanted, and very very compelling to students because they don't like it but they have a hard time denying it and they have a hard time subscribing to a metaphysics of the good or something like that so andrew we're so, gonna have um, to end and let uh, nick say the last word yeah nick gets the final <laughs> word on yeah. <laughs> no this is i just want you know, I, this was really wonderful uh thank you professor ju uh for Thank you, Professor D'Alessandro. Like, this was just uh, a D'Ambrosio. Thank you. This is a fantastic uh, discussion. It's great seeing my friends. I wish we could go out for lunch. Um, hopefully, we can get together and uh, celebrate, uh, celebrate in person soon. Yeah. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Um, Thank you guys Thank for you. hosting all of this. Thank yeah. you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.